Hey folks, welcome to Reliable Observability at Scale, Error Budgets for 1000 Plus. I'm Fred and I work at Zendesk as an SRE. Uh, we did a lot of hiring in 2019, including myself, and we currently have around 1,000 engineers. But we have a small SRE team. We've got about 10 SREs there, and we've grown, grown from uh, about one right around a year ago. So essentially, we have one SRE for every 100 engineers. And for comparison, if you read the Google book, they'll say that they have one SRE for every 10 engineers, and they call SREs a scarce resource. Um, they take an approach of embedding SREs in product engineering teams, but that's not something that we could do because of our limited SREs. Um, so at Zendesk, we consider reliability to be a core competency of ours and a top-level feature. Uh, since we do produce uh, customer support software, it needs to be up all the time, and it needs to be very reliable. And in 2019, we embarked on an engineering-wide initiative to implement product-level error budgets across geographically distributed teams and services. This appeared to be a daunting challenge as error budgets as a concept in the reliability space were still kind of evolving. Um, I joined Zendesk in June um, of this year and I kind of got thrown into the deep end of this um, and folks said, hey, you know, you just joined, you're our error budget expert. I'm like, great. So, hi, I'm Fred. I'm a, uh, I tend to think of myself as a slow logician, which is like a statistician, but not quite as cool. Um, I've done a lot of hacking in the observability space. I've hacked on time series databases, uh, StatC, Prometheus, uh, in particular histograms. Uh, I've written a lot of stuff about those. Previously, I was with uh, uh, a monitoring company called Circonus and a uh, uh, high-scale web service called Turnitin, where I worked on a lot of, a lot of production systems, broke stuff and measured stuff. Um, and I've been writing code for a while. I do need more sleep because I've got a one-year-old and a four-year-old, but I promise I won't fall asleep in the presentation. So let's take a look at the agenda for today. We're going to go over, uh, fly over the Zendesk architecture, and then I'll go into uh, how we democratized error budgets. We'll take a look at the tooling used, the approach, and the implementation. And then we'll talk about the hard thing about uh, error budgets and SLOs, and then some questions at the end. So architecture of Zendesk. In the beginning, it was a Rails app. Um, and uh, this was like many early web services. And shortly after it gained traction, we started to uh, you know, add some things that you know, looked pretty common to uh, most growing uh, architectures, you know, in particular a CDN to handle static assets, a, uh, a reverse proxy, you know, because with a one process per connection uh, web server like Rails, you're going to need something to scale out those web servers. And this is a fairly typical architecture for early monoliths. And one thing I've noticed in the industry is if you start out with a perfectly architected system, uh, your business is probably going to fail because you can't put features in fast enough to make it you know, all ugly and grow a giant monolith that everyone depends on and makes a lot of money. Um, but as, as things grew, we started to implement uh, microservices, maybe not microservices as we know today, but essentially you know, specialized services and sort of a service-oriented architecture approach. And uh, you know, other Rails apps started to grow, and we started to acquire other companies. The chat uh, product in particular is based on uh, Python's Twisted uh, web server. So it's a markedly different approach than the process-based uh, Rails server. You know, so the architectures you know, already started to get a bit dissimilar. And we grew more Rails apps, added some services in Scala, Go, and um, also, Ed, you know, a few years ago, started to move things into Kubernetes on AWS. And we added more apps and uh, bought more companies. Um, in this case, the new one, newest one was Cell about a year ago. And it's something like, if you've ever worked in a large organization, you know, you'll notice it's not a, a, a perfect cookie cutter uh, architecture. You're going to have... Uh, uh, teams and products that follow Conway's law. You know, it doesn't make sense to say for a, a chat application to implement that in Rails. That's just not the right solution for that problem. So coming to a unified architecture is something that's uh, really not realistic in a lot of cases, um, especially under a large organ engineering organization. But with that in mind, what approach should we take for implementing error budgets when we've got kind of a heter heterogeneous architecture like this? 
So let's dive into that. So let's, first, let's take a look at a little bit of history. Uh, you know, we kind of had a Cambrian explosion of SLIs, SLOs, and error budgets in 2016 with the Google Book. And over the next couple of years, you know, we had the SRE reliability workbook come out. Uh, the famous video Liz is out there casting right now by Liz and Seth about SLOs, SLAs, SLIs, oh my. Um, and then, you know, just a number of additional talks. And in doing research for figuring out how we should uh, democratize error budgets across the, you know, a thousand person engineering team, I started to dig into the definitions of SLIs and SLOs and error budgets very closely. And what I noticed was that in, you know, the SRE book, you know, you had certain definitions which varied very subtly different from the SRE workbook, which were subtly different from other parts. And to try and get those um, into code for a lot of people, and also in a format that you can plug into a monitoring system, uh, became an exercise where I had to be very pedantic about defining exactly what these were. So here's what I came up with. Uh, so SLIs, we all know, these delineate good requests from bad requests. Here's three examples. We've got a percentile-based latency SLI on top there. Uh, we've got an availability-based SLI in the middle. And we've got just uh, account-based uh, SLI on the bottom. And these are all English statements that you know, we might spout off. But how do, we, you know, how do we parse these? How do we make it easy to understand you know, how these are structured? And so I, I did a lot of thinking and talking to colleagues. And we came up with a parsing structure. An SLI has a metric identifier. That's the part I have in red. This is essentially you know, a metric that you, know, you can expose in your monitoring system. It's got a metric operator, you know, less than, not equal to, less than. And it's got a metric value. And so you put all three of these together, and you've essentially got uh, you know, a formula that you can throw an SLI at that you come up with it and see if it parses well. And if you can't find each of these three parts in your SLI, chances are something is wrong. And you know, depending on if you have a bespoke service, you might choose an SLI based on a, a metric for that service. So you might be missing one or more of these. SLOs, these are binding targets for SLIs. And in, a, in an event-based uh, SLO, you essentially have the number of good requests divided by the number of total requests over a time range. So let's take a look at what those are. Now the top right one with percentiles, that's very wordy. And as uh, Dave Chappelle is fond of saying, that stuff is confusing. Um, so let's, let's read that out. 99% of 95th percentile homepage latency over five minutes, less than 500 milliseconds over the trailing month. Wow, that's a tough one. Uh, the availability one is easier. You know, 99% of my requests shouldn't be 5xx over the past seven days. And the bottom one is, is a lot simpler. 95% of my homepage requests should be under 100 milliseconds in the last 24 hours. How do we parse these? Well, we've got a success objective, which is uh, essentially what percentage of your requests need to uh, meet this SLI definition of good requests. We've got our SLI in the middle, and we've got a time range. The time range is the one that I see uh, left off uh, in most cases where folks don't have a well-formed SLI. They'll say, hey, we want 95% you know, of our uh, you know, search page requests to be under 100 milliseconds. What time range are you talking about? Are you talking about a week? Are you talking about an hour? Um, because the way that you defined uh, this time range tells you a lot about who the audience of this SLO and consequently the error budget is and you know, how you think your service can perform there. So you know, to wrap up on SLOs again, you, know, you have to have these three uh, parts, success, success objective, an SLI, and a period. Error budgets, you know, nobody's perfect. You know, we have error budgets so that we can, you know, we don't want our service to be too perfect because then we'd never be able to innovate. We don't want to move fast and break things, but we do want to move fast and break things that we can measure. So an error budget is essentially one minus your SLO. Uh, 
you know, in this case, you know, if we have a success objective of 99%, our error budget is 1%, we can let 1% of our requests go. So this is very similar to the previous definitions. Instead of a success objective here, I have one minus my success objective, which I'll call the error budget. I'll have my SLI, and then I'll have my period. Same type of formula. And this is something we gave to every engineer to say like, you know, okay, we're in this company-wide effort to implement error budgets. You need to have something that looks like this to move forward. And this worked remarkably well because it gave them, you know, a formula, an equation that they could put together and, you know, figure out if what they needed to have was on target. So to kind of sum up the, uh, you know, keys to error budget democratization, you know, we want real world examples that are easy to reference. We want formulas that both humans and code and monitoring systems can pr process. And we want to be explicit. We want to be pedantic. These really small details such as, you know, the fact that you need a period there, a time range, can make a really big difference. So how did we actually implement this? Let's get into that. First, we'll talk about tooling. We have dozens of teams, and as a result, you know, we've got a few different tools. Uh, for metrics, we're capturing a few metrics in prompt style format, uh, but the bulk of it is in uh, StatsD, particularly the, the dog StatsD format, because we use data dogs to process metrics. Uh, we were processing logs with Elk for a while, but we decommissioned our Elk cluster this year. And uh, we record logs as JSON. We send those to Datadog, and we have uh, archives stored in AWS S3. APM, we use Datadog. For network performance, we use Datadog again. And we also implement Thousand Eyes. That gives us a lot of insight into our network. Distributed tracing is currently a work in progress. Um, and uh, learning a lot about that here today. A lot of great presentations on that. So StatsD. You know, they clearly did not spend a lot of time making uh, a shiny logo. And StatsD itself, you know, is not particularly shiny, but, you know, it makes it really easy to measure server and service performance. It's dead simple. And it's ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere. There's tons of StatsD clients. We also use StatsD to measure client performance. Um, and uh, that's a little bit more difficult, uh, but uh, and for a couple reasons, you know, take for example our chat server. We want to measure the number of times that uh, we have disconnects. The problem is if the chat server disconnects, you can't send them telemetry. You know, so we had to engineer in uh, storing telemetry in the uh, client side storage, and then when the chat server would reconnect, we'd send that up to Datadog. There's also caching. Um, how do you deal with that? And then you have a large uh, set of browser and device variants. Uh, when you're measuring uh, StatsD data at the client side. But we kind of follow a standard approach of logs, traces, and metrics, you know, the, the three pillars of observability, or as I like to call it, telemetry. Um, and, you know, we have a, a few experts there. You know, I'm, I'm considered a metrics expert. Uh, you know, we have Lumberjack Steve, who's really good with logs. We have a couple of folks who are good with APM. And, uh, you know, so our expertise kind of breaks down by team. But the way that we've uh, tried to scale it out to 1,000 engineers, we have a Slack channel called Ask SRE, where folks can ask us questions. We've got a reliability champions group, uh, which meets monthly in different geographic locations, or ge different geographic regions, where we talk about different reliability initiatives. Um, and we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, on education. You know, I gave an observability one-on-one -on -one presentation to different uh, geographic locations, and you know we have a hands-on with Datadog workshop. So that's kind of sums up our approach. You know we try to democratize this expertise. We use StatsD because it's simple to collect telemetry. So technical approach. Percentiles. Who here uses percentiles? Who here loves percentiles? Not as many folks. Uh, I. I have, you know, opinions on them. I like to say lies, darn lies, and percentiles. Why is this? Um, it's easy to get the math wrong. 
if you, you know, if you look at that, uh, let's go back. Look at that top right one. That's a mouthful. Percentiles are d tough to get correct. And one of the big reasons for that is that they're missing what I call the X factor, which is sample volume. You know, if you say my 99th percentile for my search endpoint was 100 milliseconds, was that 10 requests or was that 10 million requests? I don't know because I've already aggregated that data and stored it. And what you'll find is uh, several vendors out there have bugs in their percentile tools. Um, and, you know, they'll have uh, SLO monitors that, you know, will aggregate, uh, you know, a day's worth of data and give you enough time for that. But the problem is you can't aggregate that over a month. So the math here gets very tricky. There are some exceptions, exceptions to aggregating those, um, but it goes into complicated papers with the math is really over my head, frankly. Um, so in general, we've tried to avoid using percentiles because it just raises too many questions. So what do we do instead? We use counters. We count numbers of requests. We count you know, the number of requests under our SLI and the total requests, and that gives us all we really need to know. Counters are easy to understand. Yeah, who here watched Sesame Street growing up? Some folks, okay. All the older folks in the audience. Um, counters are easy to implement. You know, StatsD has you know, increment, decrement methods. They're easy to aggregate. When you store uh, counter-based telemetry in a time series database, that's stored in one time slot. You can take that and another set of time slots that add up to any arbitrary time, like say a week or a month, and you can sum them together and you'll get zero loss for that calculation. And it's easy to get the math right. You know, you add them up, you divide them, you multiply them. Very simple stuff, a lot simpler than percentiles. So how have we approach this for SLIs? We use uh, counters for latency SLIs. Um, say, for example, you know, my SLI is my request time is less than 500 milliseconds. I'll count up all those requests that were less than 500 milliseconds. I'll have a count of the total requests, I'll divide them, and uh, I'll add my success objective and my time range, and that's it. I'll get an answer that is extremely accurate. So how have we implemented this? Who here is familiar with histograms? A couple of folks, I like to talk about these a lot. So I call this the flexible latency SLI approach we capture counts of requests that are in certain bands. That's uh, the image on Wikipedia's histogram page. You can see two different implementations. First one, you know, we call it the you know, ordinary histogram or just the histogram, where we would count up you know, numbers of requests that were you know, between 100 and 200 milliseconds, 200 to 300. Or we could also, we have an implementation that we can use a cumulative histogram, which is essentially what Prometheus used where uh, you have a running count of the requests that are below a certain value. And uh, you know, with this approach, we end up getting one time series for each of these latency bands. And uh, you know, the stat C metric will look something like that in the bottom. We'll have a namespace, you know, we'll have an endpoint. You know, our monolith has about 1,000 endpoints right now. And we'll have a latency band. And so using this, I can get a count of requests that were within a certain latency band for a certain endpoint. This is what our bands look like. You know, we have every 10 milliseconds from 10 to 100 milliseconds, every 100 milliseconds from 100 to one second, every 500 milliseconds from one second and 10 seconds, and every five seconds from 10 seconds to 60 seconds. And for an example, if, if I record a latency value of 547 milliseconds, my metric tag will be LA600 in the cumulative implementation, or it could be GT500 less than or equal to 600 in the banded bin, or the ordinary histogram implementation. So with this approach, what do we get? We get relatively low errors per latency band. Say here, you know, if I'm recording something between one second and 1.5 seconds, and 1.5 seconds to two seconds, you know, I might have an error, you know, plus or minus, you know, 250 milliseconds in the worst case. And that's not bad. You know, that's, that's good enough for what we're doing 
with a Ruby-based web service to get really good results. You know, these are not as precise as HDR histograms, which stands for high dynamic range. Uh, there's a couple notable ones out there, guillotines, high dynamic range histogram, and the uh, Circonus log linear histogram. Both of those use, you know, upwards of, you know, 40, 50,000 bins. Uh, this implementation, we've only got 40. You know, so it's not quite as precise, but it gets us, you know, 80, 90% of the way there. We do have some possible cardinality issues. You know, if I've got, you know, say 1,000 or 1,100 endpoints in my app, and then I've got 40 bins, you know, that's 40,000 possible values right there. You know, multiply that, uh, you know, times the number of hosts, multiply that times two other metrics, and pretty soon, you know, you might have a couple million dedicated time series for this approach. But, you know, if it takes up two million time series, that's actually not bad. Two million is a fairly no low number in terms of time series databases at scale. And the nice thing about this approach is you can implement it with any monitoring vendor or time series database. I can use this with RRD if I wanted to, although I don't know why I would. So what kind of data can we get out of this? This is a, a latency band graph where each uh, line is representative of the number of requests that were within a certain range. So, you know, here, you know, I've got my yellow line up there that's representing, you know, the number of requests that are around 500 milliseconds. You know, and I've got my uh, uh, purple one down there that's, you know, at 100 milliseconds. And just looking at the volume, I can find that 99% of my requests fall in there. So what can I do with that? Well, that tells me I probably want to choose my SLI initially around 500 milliseconds. You might say, like, well, can't you just use percentiles to do that? Again, you don't know the volume. This shows me the total volume of requests. So this has been something very useful that we've deployed. Our engineers can look at something like this and say, like, you know, normally for this endpoint, I'd just be guessing at what my SLI should be, but this gives me a pretty educated guess for the first time. Here's another approach with latency bands here. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, one endpoint, you know, we clearly have a request volume surge in there. Is that something for concern? Well, looking at the different latency bands, I can see that, you know, my light blue and dark blue bands at the top, those are the lowest latency bands. So I got a, a surge of a lot of fast requests. So the system performed well. If uh, the uh, yellow uh, bars in the bottom had expanded, that would tell me my service slowed down a lot. So this is a great visualization that I can use. And again, you know, this is something that's really easy to implement if you don't have access to high definition or high, di high dynamic range histograms. Um, this is a good simple approach with simple tools that you can you know, implement for a lot of engineers and they all get it. So you know, we've seen you know, how we can define these error budgets. We've seen how we can implement them with simple tools but what's the hard thing? So let's go take a look at, you know, brief architecture again. You know, I can have a request that, say, comes into my CDN, you know, hops through my proxy, through my Rails app into some microservices. And for each of those, I can get, you know, a number of different SLIs. And we all know that, you know, the further you get down in the stack, you know, the, the more repeatable you want your request to be. But you know, when I initially started talking to folks there, I said, you know, we want to measure what the users see, you know, because as I mentioned before, you know, the user experience is very different than what you might get at a certain microservice. You know, we have varied uses patterns from different users, you know, they could be on different devices on, on different networks. And so really we want this SLI between our CDN and the user to be the one that's the most important because that's going to capture everything beneath it. Even if the request is cached, it'll cache that. If the request goes down, you know, 100 microservices, it'll represent that. So really, the key thing to do here is focus on the users, because that's what matters. And also focus on the audiences that you're addressing. You know, I can have uh, my success objective and my SLI for a certain, uh, you know, error budget. Um, but really, I've got five different error budgets that I need to construct here. You know, my SREs and my NOC need to have a time range of five minutes. You know, my product engineers need to be looking at that for an hour. 
My product managers want to see how that's doing over a week. VPs want to know about a month, you know, because they'll say, hey, our, you know, trouble-free availability for this month was 99.99, you know, and my, you know, C-suite will be looking at these numbers over a quarter. So let's sum it up. You know, how, how did we implement uh, error budgets successfully over a thousand engineers in about four months? Give everyone a formula, make it simple. Use simple tools that can give you rich data. Use latency bands, in particular histograms, to grab duration data. Measure your SLIs to the client as close as possible and use error budgets with appropriate time ranges for different audiences. Thanks. Thank you. We've got time for questions, if there are any. So the question was, if we have a set of chain services, um, do we record just the uh, deepest service or all of them? And my answer is we, we record all of them as much as possible. We try to uh, record, in some cases, you know, redundant telemetry. You know, we'll collect uh, uh, service times using metrics and also APM, and we'll compare them. You know, that's actually yielded points where you know, we found you know, our APM wasn't running in one uh, point of delivery or you know, some of our metrics were off there. And this is, uh, you know, this is something I really had to push on because you know, folks said like, hey, you know, you're wasting data. And, and I said, well, you know, there's a reason that the space shuttle had five different you know, redundant systems. You know, because when something fails, you know, we've got a backup. Hey, Fred, thanks a lot. Um, if you follow the Google S3 model, um, one of the things that they use error budgets to drive is uh, very specifically deciding if a product team is going to work on features or work on reliability um, and sort of use that as an absolute decision point. Um, I think that can be harder in smaller organizations. What has Zendesk decided to do? Do you drive those decisions from the error budget and do you stick to that rigorously or do you make that a case-by-case -case decision? Thanks. Uh, so the question is, um, you can hear that on the mic. So we, as part of this effort, um, we not only implemented the technical phases, but we had each team develop uh, an out-of-error budget process. So it was basically a document saying like, hey, if our error budget you know, is exhausted, here's how we're going to prioritize work. So that was part of the formal effort. And it's actually one of the most important parts of it, even though it's not the most you know, technically involved. Sweet. Oh, yeah. One more back here. Hi. Um, so was this implemented like at Zendesk at a team by team basis? Like they start with a few teams first? Or is it, and was it like a top down from the top or was it a grassroots um, started from engineering then management took it on? Like how, how, how were you able to um, implement it across the whole organization in the time frame? Okay. So it was an initiative that came down from the top. Uh, you know, because part of, you know, part of our mission is reliability is a core feature of ours. Um, so that was supported all the way, you know, down from the CEO to the SVP of engineering, all the way down to the teams. Um, how did we, um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Oh, how did we roll it out? Um, we initially started with one team, uh, kind of in a pilot phase, and then we moved on to six. And then we have an ongoing effort to expand that further. So it was kind of a tiered stage rollout. You know, and that, that was helpful because we could get feedback from teams on what was working and what wasn't. Thank you.